try to pull myself together there emotionally after the time of uh, worship through through a song. So appreciate the the music team and uh, what they bring to us each week. I was observing as I was looking out at the the folks that were there on the platform and how beautiful it was to see uh, the variation in ages that's there. I mean, we've got um, from teens on up, um, we, <laughs> way, way up, way up. Is it okay to say or not? Yeah. <laughs> up there, how about that, right? But how beautiful is that? I, I love that. I love to see that. Um, just a blessing to see uh, all the way down from uh, 15, I'll say on the lower end, because it is uh, my son's birthday today, although I don't see him, he must have walked out for a second there, but uh, 15 today and uh, up to later years, and pray, we praise God for that, and praise God to see uh, older and younger and all in between serving the Lord together and worshiping through song. This is a very special day uh, for me personally, and that's part of the emotion, I think, there. Uh, it is our oldest son's birthday, and we're thankful for that, of course. Um, it's also uh, 22 years today that I came to know Christ, and I look back at that, and I think, you know, now uh, I'm 42, so more than half my life as a believer, and really rejoicing in what God has done in no way, shape, or form. If you would have asked me on October 25th or 26th, of 1998, uh, what will you be doing 22 years from now? This would not have been on the radar, I assure you. This, this would not have ever been remotely on the radar, but I praise God for it, and we're thankful that we're here with you. Let me give a, just a few brief things that are going on, a few brief updates, and then we'll jump into our, our sermon for today. Uh, of course, we greet those who are watching online. I know there are some, and the numbers are are, are pretty healthy, actually. Uh, uh, praise the Lord for that. Those who are watching online and some in our overflow as well, and of course, those of you who are gathered here. We are continuing our prayer challenge, and I'm thankful for that. And I try to say something about that each week because I want to urge uh, the folks of Rikers Ridge to pray. Uh, God is calling us as a church to pray, uh, to humble ourselves before him. And so what is he going to say about it this week? Well, I want to encourage you to engage your children in prayer. Don't look at children, even young children, and, and think, well, you know, there, there's nothing there. No, engage your children in prayer. And so the prayer challenge, of course, is to pray for an hour a week and to get a prayer buddy in doing that. And so my prayer buddy uh, is my son, and my wife's prayer buddy is another son. And so uh, we can pray with our children. In fact, I would encourage you to do that. And in fact, that is a way that we can grow in our own prayer lives is to pray with our children or to, to pray with younger folks. In part, that helps sharpen us. And so pray with your children, pray with your grandchildren, pray with your nieces or nephews, pray with children. That's a good thing to do. And uh, if you're struggling with that hour of prayer, I meant to grab one from my office. I didn't um, highly commend to you Don Whitney's Praying the Bible, wonderful book about praying through God's Word. Next time I remember, I'll grab one and I'll be able to show you that book, but would highly commend that. Tonight at 6, you know, many of you, uh, that Josh Hirschberger is coming to speak. Uh, Josh is a, a friend and a pastor, an attorney, and he's uh, speaking on gospel-centered citizenship. And the timing, of course, is uh, very appropriate. Uh, let me remind you that Josh is not here to push a particular political agenda, but he's here to look at what the Scriptures say about citizenship. How should we, as Christians, uh, approach citizenship in kind of a dual kingdom there? We're, we're citizens of this country, but we're citizens of a, a greater kingdom. And so I look forward to hearing from my friend Josh tonight. That's at 6 p.m., also, today was a special day because we rebooted Sunday school. So phase two of Sunday school today, uh, did not hear any, you can tell me afterward if there's negative reports about it. I didn't hear any so far. Nobody complained to me as I walked in this morning. So that's a good thing. Um, I want to urge all of us when, we, when it comes to Sunday school and this restart, let, let's, let's do our part together. Is, isn't it good to be together? It is good to be together. Now, if you've watched the news, you see uh, numbers are going up and whatnot. 
So I want to encourage all of us to do our part so that we can continue to gather together. It's important for us to be able to gather together. So if you are sick, stay home. And I'm not saying that to be rude. I'm saying if you're sick, stay home. That's one of the reasons why we have uh, the online service now. Is it as good as being here in person? Of course it's not. However, it is an option uh, if you are sick. And so we would urge you, if, if you're sick, uh, to, to stay home that week and then come back when you can. And then practice the things that we all know to do. Social distancing, hand washing, um, using masks at appropriate times. Why do we do that? Because, again, well, part of it is neighbor love, right? We love our neighbor. And so um, if, if I have something, I don't, I don't care if it's COVID or, what did I say the other, COVID, Bovid, Movid, whatever it is, uh, if you have it, I don't want it. Okay, and if I have it, I don't want you to get it. And so uh, we certainly don't want, I'm not trying to make light of a pandemic, if, uh, so certainly don't take offense. But what I'm saying is, even in a normal year, we had a situation maybe three, four years ago where we had a stomach bug that ran through and we had to shut a service down. This can happen. And so be cautious. Everyone do their part. Uh, we don't want to shut down again. We want to be diligent. It is a blessing to be together. And so because of those things, let's be diligent to all do our part so that we can be together. All right, enough of that. Let, let us pray together. It's a long text this morning. There's a lot to get to. So we have our 60 seconds of prayer, and then I'll jump in with the sermon. Father, we thank you for the text that's there before us in Romans 14. Pray that you give us ears to hear, humble hearts to receive the word implanted. Pray that we would be doers of the word and not merely hearers only. And that when it comes to our relationships with one another within the body, that we would love one another we would walk in love as we're exhorted to do here that we would accept one another as you have accepted us in spite of our differences and that we would zealously pursue unity even though in many ways we are different we pray by your strength that we would do these things for your glory for our good and even for the good of those around us that they would see the love that's here and by this, they would know that we're your disciples and that they too would be drawn to the good news of Jesus Christ. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. I hope you've uh, turned there by now. Pastor Mark there reading uh, Romans 14, the text for today. It is a long text. This is the last series in our last sermon in our series, our brief series. Uh, how can we honor Jesus in troubled times? And we've tried to answer that in various ways. And this morning we're answering that by saying that we honor Jesus in troubled times by walking in love and pursuing unity within the family of God. So we finish this series today. If you happen to be curious, next week will be our Reformation Day uh, sermon. Even though I recognize it's, it's not October, it'll be November 1st, but we will have that. And that also will be the end of a series. In that case, it's five sermons over inclusive, I guess, four-year period. And so that one will be the end of a series there. Um, but I encourage you, of course, to be here for that. Uh, how many of you grew up watching cartoons? I'll be honest. I never watched a cartoon in my life. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> I, 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 
Oh, haven't quit yet. Yes, yeah, some still watching, I'm sure. Uh, so you don't, you, that's inclusive of those who are, most of us grew up watching cartoons, right? That's part of growing up uh, in this context. Now, depending on when you grew up, those cartoons would differ, right? The cartoons maybe that you watched when you were growing up might be different than the ones that I watched. If we took a sampling of people from different age groups, I'm sure that we could discern what were the popular cartoons in each decade. If you were a young boy in the 1980s, I'm sure that you grew up watching He-Man at some point, along with another cartoon that's seen a resurgence in recent days in a different form, and that is the Transformers. That was a huge show when I was a kid, and, and uh, not the, I'm not a huge fan of the modern version. I haven't seen most of those movies, but I absolutely loved the 1980s cartoon, the Transformers. Uh, several years ago, I introduced my boys to that. They, they have them on DVD. You can watch the old seasons. And so I introduced my kids to that. They love it, even though it is somewhat outdated. In fact, we even have one of the DVDs there. Now, if you're not familiar with the Transformers, they're robots that turn into uh, cars or planes or other things like that. So the good guys, the Autobots, they usually change into cars or trucks. The bad guys, the Decepticons, transform into planes also a gun, and to show how outdated it is, one of the main characters even transforms into a cassette player. And so you might, if you watch that show, you may have to explain to somebody what that guy's actually transforming into. What is that thing? Uh, perhaps the coolest Transformers, though, were the ones that joined together to form this mega robot. In, I looked this up on the internet. Apparently, in, in true Transformer, uh, the, the Transformer fan world, they're called combiners. I didn't know that. But basically, several robots that came together to form one huge robot. So usually it was five or six. You got one for each of the legs. You got one for each of the arms. And then you got a torso and maybe a head. And they all come together and make this gigantic robot. Uh, but the interesting thing about that mega robot is that the individual robots that came together to form it were not identical. In fact, they were far from it. So if you take one particular group, they called them the Constructicons, you had various types of construction equipment that came together to form this massive robot that they called Devastator. So you had a dump truck, you had a front end loader, you had a cement mixer, you had a crane, you had a bulldozer. All these different things come together and they form this giant robot devastator. I, I assure you, if you're sitting there rolling your eyes, that this was very impressive to a six-year-old boy, which I would have been during the first season of that, that show. Now, in some ways, the church is like those combiner robots in the Transformers cartoon. Uh, thankfully, we're not robots, okay? I get that. And we don't actually physically combine to form these giants that walk around and whatnot. I'm glad for that as well. But the fact is, we are different in many ways. We're not, we're not the same uh, in many ways. And yet, in the imagery that the Apostle Paul uses in the New Testament, we do come together to form one body in a spiritual sense. The Apostle Paul uses uh, that type of language in, in multiple places, but in particular, he uses it in the book of 1 Corinthians we come together to form one body in a spiritual sense, and that is the body of Christ, the church. And if that body is going to function properly, then all its parts are needed, and those parts should not disparage one another. The, the, the ear shouldn't mock the eye, and, and so on and so forth. And that's exactly what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning in, in verse 14, he says this, For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot says... Because I am not a hand, I am not a part of the body. It is not for this reason any the less a part of the body. And if the ear says, because I am not an eye, I am not a part of the body. It is not for this reason any the less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But now God has placed the members, each one of them, in the body just as he desired. If they were all one member, where would the body be? But now there are many members, but one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Or again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, it is much truer that the members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary, and those members of the body which we deem less honorable, on these we bestow more abundant honor, 
and our less presentable members become much more presentable, whereas our more presentable members have no need of it. But God has so composed the body, giving more abundant honor to that member which lacked, so that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are Christ's body and individually members of it. My friends, the gospel breaks down barriers to create one body in Christ. That's what the gospel does. That's exactly what Paul says about Jew and Gentile in the book of Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 2, we read about this when the Apostle Paul is speaking about the gospel breaking down barriers. We read that, that that is exactly what the gospel does. Even the biggest barrier culturally that was perceived in the ancient world, that between Jew and Gentile, he says, but now in verse 13, he says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, by it having put to death the enmity. And yet, despite the fact that the church is is one body, and despite the fact that in another place, in the book of Galatians, in chapter 3 and verse 28, he says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free man, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. In spite of things like that, the reality is that differences between believers remain. And so even though Paul says that, what I just read in the book of Galatians, we still have male and female, right? We've got males and females. All I'm looking around and I'm seeing males and females. We still, in, in that world, there's still uh, Jew and Gentile. The, those cultural remnants are coming into their Christian lives. And the folks in the church, in the New Testament, and today we'll talk about, had to learn to love each other in spite of the differences that come because of the differences in their backgrounds or differences because of this or differences because of that and so they had to learn to love each other even though they were not identical twins or I don't you got twins triplets whatever I don't know what it is when you get to the the number that's in this room right now but they're not identical and so they had to learn to love each other in spite of that my friends that is certainly the case today Look around you for just a moment. It's okay. Look around. I I, I mean, look around. You you can look around and see who's here. Okay? We come together with different family backgrounds, and I know that to be the case. We come together with different vocations or careers. We come together different ages. I've already drawn attention to that. We come together with different economic status, uh, different geographic backgrounds and so on and so forth. Yeah, many of you guys are from here, but some are not from here. And so some of us are are foreigners, so to speak, to Madison or to Indiana. It's no wonder that we think differently sometimes, right? We're, We're coming with all these different backgrounds. We're bringing these things together. It's no wonder. And yet we can, the truth is that we can still be one in Christ, one in the faith that ties us together. And we can walk in love for Christ in spite of and love for one another in spite of these differences that are there that threaten to tear us apart. But sadly, my observation is that many, perhaps most Christians in local churches, have lost perspective on this unity amidst diversity. That's especially true in recent years. I've seen a change even in the 22 years that I've been a believer. I've seen this uh, getting worse, not getting better. It seems as if many believers in local churches are committed to pursuing uniformity and not unity in Christ. They want things to be exactly the same. Uh, Others have stated this as well. We want everyone 
to be lockstep on everything. Everyone must have exactly marched to exactly the same beat. It has to be exactly the same. We all want to be identical, if you will, on every issue, whether it is major or minor. Uh, and that tendency creates uh, that tendency towards uniformity creates churches that become very culturally isolated and then eventually insulated and, and many times they die and they're only capable of impacting people who are exactly like them. If, you're not, if you don't fit this cookie cutter mold, we're not going to impact you with the gospel. To which the New Testament says, hogwash. The gospel breaks down barriers and people are not going to be exactly like us. Why is this the case? I, I thought about that. Well, there's many reasons. In fact, I'm sure a lot of it is just the natural human tendency to surround ourselves with people who are exactly like ourselves, right? We, we tend to do that. We, we, so if you want the nerdy engineer church or whatever, then you get a lot of people like me together and you form a church. And that's what people do. What are the other reasons, though? And I think some of these are ramping up. So what are some reasons why this takes place? Well, one big one, I think, is biblical illiteracy. My, uh, People, believers, even professing believers, don't know their Bibles very well, which causes a whole host of issues. One being that they don't recognize the beauty and true unity in Christ in spite of diversity, which speaks to the, that speaks to the unifying and the transforming power of the gospel. The fact that two or five or ten or a hundred people who are very different from one another in lots of ways can have a common bond in Christ and love one another actually, not like in theory, but really love one another in spite of those differences, the gospel has transforming power. But if we don't know that the Bible teaches that, we're, we're, we're influenced more by the culture than we are by the scriptures. Then, because people are biblically illiterate, they're unable to distinguish between major issues that are central to the faith and lesser issues that are not, uh, issues that maybe it's okay for us to disagree on. And then because people don't know the Bible well, they don't think biblically. As I've said many times over the last five years, genuine wisdom comes when we learn to apply God's Word to life, to everyday circumstances. But we can't do that if we don't think biblically. How can you apply something that you don't even know what it says? So we don't think biblically this is a big problem. What other reasons are there for us to, to pursue uniformity rather than unity? Well, another one is the influence of culture. Uh, my friends, I, I don't have to tell you this. I know you know this. We live in an increasingly divided and an increasingly hostile world. People are eager to fight over all sorts of issues. All they want to do is fight. I've told you before, in the gym sometimes it's, it humors me. Uh, to see CNN and Fox News on right next to each other. They'll be reporting on the exact same story, and it's like, what world are we living in here? I guess the truth is somewhere in there, but it's just you're coming from different angles, and people are just screaming at each other. And that mindset has crept into the church, as we considered last week. We don't practice what we learned last week in the book of James, being quick to hear, or quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. And, and so we're, we're quick to get angry. Somebody says something and we're offended, horribly offended by this all the time. And the, the scriptures would say, back up, back the truck up. Quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. And then our self-centeredness. Our natural tendency as sinful people is to be selfish. That, that is a natural, that's part of fallen man is for us to be selfish. And that's encouraged by a culture that for decades has, has sought to teach us that the greatest good is, is yourself. Uh, I always go back to that ridiculous song from the 80s and they made us sing it until our jaws locked up. Uh, the greatest love of all is learning to love yourself. <laughs> What? What? That is not what the Bible says. That's what Jesus Christ says no greater love has anyone that would lay down his life for his friends. And we take love and make it selfish? Come on. And yet that's the mindset of the culture and it reinforces what we already are like in our natural human state. We, we love ourselves so much we want what we want when we want it. And so it reinforces that, and we're told that that's good. 
And so what happens is that even professing believers become more concerned about their rights, their actual or their perceived rights, than they care about other people. Why is that okay? Paul's saying here, no, no, no. Our our primary concern should be, of course, for the Lord and then for loving and honoring other people and accepting them. I'm not saying that there's no time to stand up for our rights as Christians. Absolutely, that is the case. But we're talking today about how people conduct themselves amongst other believers in the church. We're talking about with other believers. So am I going to stand up for my rights? It has to be this way. Why? When we're primarily concerned with ourselves, are we in any way being obedient to what the Apostle Paul says in Philippians chapter 2? I think we're not. Of course we're not. Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, unified in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. And then he goes into that glorious passage about having the mind of Christ and the fact that he humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross, that he most certainly did not deserve. And he's saying, is that your mindset? That level of unselfishness. So again, biblical illiteracy is a problem. The influence of culture is a problem. Self-centeredness is a problem. And then uh, I would add to this the ch- what, what people call the church growth movement. So why are you attacking that? Well, the fact of the matter is we all want our churches to grow, right? I, I desire Rikers Ridge to grow, and I think that's a healthy and a good thing. But the church growth movement that sprung up in the 20th century and still continues today in many ways is built on something that's called the homogeneous unit principle. Some of you may have heard of that, where churches are urged to to reach people who are exactly like them. What's your strategy as a church? Find the people who are exactly like you and reach those people. And so by design, that produces churches that are built on uniformity rather than unity. If there's people who are exactly like you, go out and reach them. Now, I'm all for reaching people with the gospel. And many times I get it that those connections are going to be there because people are like you. But at the same time, the gospel is transforming. And it breaks down barriers. And it's so much more beautiful even when there's people who aren't exactly alike. And they still love each other because they have a common bond in Jesus Christ. That's beautiful. That is glorious. There's, there, this is one of the most beautiful things you could ever imagine is two people who have very little in common according to the flesh, but they have Jesus Christ in common. And because of that, they actually really love each other. And they demonstrate that in a variety of ways. And yet, even in spite of, uh, even in spite of these things that I've mentioned, Apparently, we're not uniform enough for many people in churches because churches are still prone to all sorts of conflict over minor issues. Churches fight over the most ridiculous things. Sometimes I wonder when I look out at the conflict that's in local churches and the conflict that's brewing in local churches, if anyone has even ever read Romans 14. I I hear about some things and I'm like, "Do do you guys even know this is in the Bible? You ever read this before? Does anyone still understand that we can actually disagree on some issues and even disagree passionately, even have strong convictions on certain issues and still love each other and maintain fellowship with one another? Or are we so worldly that we're going to bite each other over every disagreement and seeing every issue as something to go to the mat over? Is every issue really a hill worth dying on? Is that really the case? My friends, if that's the route we're going to pursue, then I think we need to be mindful of another caution that the Apostle Paul gave in the book of Galatians. In Galatians chapter 5, we read this in verse 13. For you were called to freedom, brethren, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. It's really important. 
But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. Take care that you are not consumed by one another. My friends, it is my observation that we really, really, really desperately need to hear what the Apostle Paul is saying to us in Romans 14. And we need to consider how it applies in our context. And so that's what we're going to do today. In the process, I'm sure some of you will probably get upset. And so send all complaints to 2601 North Rikers Ridge Road, Madison, Indiana, 47. I'm just kidding. Don't do that. You can, but I don't encourage you to do that. All right. We got, there, there's a whole bunch of imperatives in the text. There's a whole bunch of commands in the text. And if we were going to sit here, we'd be here for like three hours. And I'm pretty sure you don't want to be here for three hours. Or if you're watching online, you probably don't want to watch for three hours. So we're going to summarize in four basic lessons what the text says. And I would encourage you to go back and read this text over again, especially if this is something that's new to you or kind of rubs you the wrong way. The first lesson in our text today, again, summarizing what we're seeing here, is this. There always have been and always will be issues of conscience that Christians do not agree on. There always have been and always will be issues of conscience that Christians do not agree on. If you're familiar with the book of Romans, you probably recognize that this is one of the weightiest books in the Bible when it comes to theology. The first 11 chapters of the book of Romans deal with all sorts of weighty topics, uh, amazing doctrinal truth, the state of man, the gospel, the sovereignty of God, all these weighty theological topics. Then in chapter 12, we begin to see a shift in the book, uh, which was originally a letter to the believers in Rome. Now, good theology is always practical, as some have said, but Paul specifically focuses in those last few chapters on applying the truth in practical ways to some circumstances that were being faced by the Roman church. Now, when we come to Romans chapter 14 and into chapter 15, here's what we see. The problem there is division in the church. Does that sound familiar? We've looked at this before, the problem of division in the church. Uh, in fact, in the book of 1 Corinthians, we see that all over the place. The first four chapters and then at points in between later in the book. In fact, there's a portion of 1 Corinthians in chapter 8 that sounds very similar to what we're seeing in Romans 14, albeit with some differences. And hopefully you'll remember that. It was, it was dealing with meat sacrifice to idols, if you remember our time in 1 Corinthians. So what are the specific causes of division that are identified here in Romans? Well, mostly it has to do with eating habits and dietary restrictions. Uh, it's not entirely clear what the specific issue is because Paul doesn't come right out and say, like he does in 1 Corinthians, that in that context it was eating meat sacrificed to idols. Here he just says something about eating and drinking and whatnot. But apparently there was a disagreement among the Christians there in Rome with, what, what was, with respect to what was appropriate for believers to eat. What's okay for us to eat? Uh, some were willing, apparently, to eat pretty much anything, and others had restricted themselves to a vegetarian diet. And we see that in verse 2, uh, apparently for spiritual reasons, because eating meat had the potential to violate their conscience. And so they had restricted themselves to eating only vegetables. Now, it's not entirely clear what the specific disagreement was, and, and Bible commentators debate that, but it does seem clear from the beginning of chapter 15 that this is somehow related to a Jew-Gentile divide. And it makes sense if you think about uh, the fact that later on it's, it's talking about some things that probably were dealing with the Old Testament law. There, there's been a problem many times for Christians to understand how do believers in the New Testament era apply the dietary restrictions that are there in the Old Testament law. Is it okay for us to eat these things? Is it not okay for us to eat these things? And so that's probably what was going on. Um, it, that, that would then, if that is the case, again, it would make sense why in verses 5 and 6 he starts to mention, uh, is it okay to observe certain days? For some people, they think that these certain days are special. For others, they say, no, every day is the same. And that makes sense when you look at the Old Testament law because not only was there the Sabbath, but you had these festivals or these feasts that would take place 
Three times a year, they were supposed to come and present themselves at the tabernacle, later the temple. And so you had these feasts, and Christians would be wondering, how do we handle that? If you came from a Jewish background, should I still do that, or should I not? And if you came from a Gentile background, should I start doing that? Because they're not in my cultural background, am I bound to start celebrating those things now? And so there you have it. From the very beginning of the New Testament age, in the first century, Christians have been wrestling with disagreements over certain types of issues. Uh, I I would call these secondary issues, uh, and they are that perhaps in in a sense, but for people that are wrestling with them, they're very important. So I don't, when I say they're secondary issues, I don't mean that they don't matter at all, but they're issues that to, to individual believers, they may be very important, but they do disagree on them. And so perhaps the best way to put this, as many have, is that these are called issues of conscience. Some folks' consciences are very sensitive or weak, as Paul puts it here, and so they need to put more restrictions or safeguards in place against sinning. Others don't feel so restricted by their consciences, and so they're able to do more than those who have sensitive consciences. In this case, they're able to eat things that others cannot eat. Uh, as a, a friend pointed out to me this week, this is a, very, this is a helpful corrective, even to take ba- a step back and look at this and say, even in the beginning... You know, we, sometimes we kind of put the, uh, the church in the first century on a pedestal. You know, the early church did this, and the early church did that. And that's, there are some really wonderful things that we read about in the book of Acts in the early church. But if we look at the book of Romans, we see here, and in 1 Corinthians, we see that even in the first century, believers did not agree on everything. They were not uniform. They had issues of disagreement on certain issues. And so Christians have not always seen eye to eye on everything. In fact, they never really have. And sometimes those, those differences would cause problems in their churches. Now, before we move on, I want to clarify here for a moment because I don't want you to leave with a bunch of confusion. And we need to think about this when we're looking at today. What constitutes a conscience issue or a Romans 14 type of issue? We need to ask that question. There are still people who wrestle with dietary issues, not because they want to have a healthy lifestyle, lose weight or something, but even for spiritual reasons, that does still happen. Um, And that may be similar to what we're seeing in the passage here, but in our circles, I would say that's pretty uncommon, right? I think most of the people that are here don't struggle. Maybe we struggle with too much to eat, but we don't really struggle with what exactly specifically is it. Does the Lord, is he okay with me eating this? If we're going to apply this text today, we need to consider then some very basic principles so we don't just ignore this passage and say, well, that doesn't apply anymore because I don't really care what I eat and neither does anyone around me, so it doesn't really matter. Perhaps the best way for us to consider what does constitute a Romans 14 issue is to to consider a couple of categories that do not fall under issues of conscience. So one of those would be major sin issues, major sin issues. Behaviors and attitudes that are unquestionably, very clearly, explicitly said across the scriptures as being sinful cannot be considered as issues of conscience. They're not. And so things like stealing or lying or sexual sin in its various forms or murder, things that are crystal clear, no serious biblical interpreter would look at and say, Well, the Bible says that's okay. No, things that are absolutely, obviously not okay across the scriptures, those things cannot be seen as issues of conscience. Those are not conscience issues. So no one can claim, well, that's between me and the Lord when it's something that's flagrantly sinful, okay? That's not a conscience issue. No one can say, well, we're just going to have to agree to disagree. I think murder's okay. I, I think it's not a big deal. I think stealing is fine. We can steal that's, that's bogus, okay? Can't do that. that. That's out of bounds. In fact, when it comes to major sin issues, those call for church discipline in places like Matthew 18 and 1 Corinthians 5, not loving tolerance and accommodation as we see in Romans 14. And so Paul's actually getting on the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 5 because that's the approach they're taking. Aren't we so loving? Aren't we so wonderful because this man's sleeping with his stepmother and we're okay with it? And Paul says, no, do something about it. And so those are issues that, those are not conscience issues. Those are sin issues. All right, 
What's another one? False teaching does not constitute conscience issues. What do you mean by false teaching? I'm talking about a denial of fundamental doctrines of the faith, things that constitute basic Christian orthodoxy. And so we're talking about things like the Trinity or the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ or the sinfulness of man. If you say, well, there's no such thing as sin. Okay, we got a real problem here. Okay, that's false teaching. Oh, there's no sin. And then you're like, wait a minute, are we, we have the same Bible? You got some, maybe you got a different translation or something, like a really bizarre translation. Yeah, there is sin. And so if we deny that, or the resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, why are some of you denying that the res- there is a resurrection? You believe in the resurrection of Jesus. These are fundamental doctrines of the faith. And so that is false teaching to deny those. Uh, again, the scripture speaks quite clearly both on issues of orthodoxy and on the dangers of false teaching. And so we have something like later in Romans, in Romans 16, Paul issues this warning to the church. He says, now I urge you, brethren, in verse 17, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teaching which you learn and turn away from them. For such men are slaves, not of our Lord Jesus Christ, but of their own appetites. And by their smooth and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. Clearly, he's not placing false teachers in the same category as what he's talking about in Romans 14. These are different things. This, then, is where uh, Dr. Moeller, Dr. Al Moeller's theological triage, and I've mentioned this multiple times before, I would encourage you to Google that. If you Google Moeller theological triage, you'll find his original article, which is 15 years old now. Interestingly, I just discovered uh, that there's two books that have come out on this topic in, in recent days. I look forward to reading, talking about that, that issue of theological triage. And so Dr. Moeller essentially divides this, and I think it's really helpful. I recognize it's not Scripture itself, but it is helpful. He divides various issues into three categories. So he talks about first-order issues, which would be what I just talked about, issues of basic Christian orthodoxy, like the resurrection. Those are first-order issues. If you deny those things, you are not a Christian, period, right? You deny the resurrection, there's no hope, there's no... If you deny, or 1 John, if you deny that Jesus came in the flesh, that's a big problem. Not, a, not an okay thing. First order issues. What about second order issues? Well, in Dr. Moeller's scheme, which I would agree with, these are issues that Christians can disagree on, but inevitably they will separate us into different churches or denominations. So baptism would be one of those. We can't baptize only believers and baptize infants in the same church. We can't, you can't do it. It won't work. So if I stand up there and I baptize someone and I talk about how baptism is for believers only and this symbolizes what happens when a, a, a person comes to faith in Jesus, buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life, and then the next Sunday I come up and I have an infant and I'm baptizing an infant, they're not the same, right? Hopefully you would think you're crazy if you did that. We, we, can't, we can't do that and that does separate. You can't have it both ways. Then there's this huge category of third order issues. And in the article, he talks about things like the timing of the return of Christ. These are things that Christians can disagree on and yet maintain fellowship within the same local church. They can't all be right. Basic logic tells you that. But they can disagree and still fruitfully have fellowship with one another. Issues of conscience, Romans 14 issues, would fit here too. Our own conscience may dictate that we can or cannot do certain things. But we can disagree with other believers on those things and still have fellowship in the same church if we are willing to be unselfish and work uh, to love one another, to be unselfish, to work for edification. All right. So that's the first lesson. Let's move on to the second lesson in the text. Second lesson. Each believer is accountable to the Lord for his or her conduct with respect to conscience. Or you could say this. Don't violate your conscience. Okay? Don't violate your conscience. The last verse in the text speaks to that. So throughout Romans 14, Paul is stressing that each believer is accountable to the Lord for his or her conscience. Each believer is, is accountable. So in verse 4, he says... Who are you to judge the servant of another? To eat to his own master, he stands or falls. 
and he will stand for the Lord is able to make him stand. He's stressing that vertical aspect, saying each believer is accountable to the Lord. And then in verses 5 through 9, we see Paul saying uh, that Christians uh, should be considering these issues of conscience within the framework of living for the Lord. He says, you have this conviction, you have this conviction. You, you stand in your conviction and do it for the Lord and not for men. So in this case, he's talking about days. He says, he who observes the day observes it for the Lord. And he who eats does so for the Lord, for he gives thanks to God. And he who eats not for the Lord, he does not eat and gives thanks to God. Well, how can that be? How can it be that two people see things in a completely different way, but they're both doing it for the Lord? Well, it's hard for us to understand these things. And maybe, uh, worst case, you could say, well, that guy over here is wrong. But they're doing it for the Lord. And the, the, the thing is uh, that we live for the Lord, not for ourselves. That's the point that he's making there. Verses 10 through 12, he's saying that each one of us is accountable for the Lord, to the Lord. He says that explicitly there in verse 12. So then each one of us will give an account of himself to God. And then in verses 22 and 23, it says, The faith which you have, have as your own conviction before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats, because his eating is not from faith, and whatever is not from faith is sin. So, again, we're not talking about issues that are clearly defined as sin. We're not talking about issues uh, of false teaching. We're talking about issues that Christians honestly disagree on that are not crystal clear to any sane reader of the Scriptures. And by the way, let me just insert this here. It takes humility to acknowledge that there even are issues like this because we have to allow for the fact that we might not be right about everything. Right? It takes humility to acknowledge that Romans 14 issue, if we are prideful, it's going to be very, very difficult for us to acknowledge that there even is such a thing as a Romans 14 issue because we're going to think that we are right in every single area. I've got it all figured out, and therefore, if you happen to differ from me, then you must be wrong because I'm right. <laughs> I'm right. And that's the attitude that many believers have. It's It's amazing. So I, I met lots of people like that. In fact, you may be a person like that. Don't be that way, my friends. Let's humble ourselves. The, the fact is, especially on minor issues, yeah, it could be wrong. Hold your con a conviction before the Lord, but don't condemn other people for that. Incidentally, my friends, here is the part where the, the gospel uh, intersects with our passage. Why is it that we are accountable to the Lord? Why is it that we're accountable to the Lord? Well, in one sense, it's because God's our creator, right? Everyone is accountable to the Lord in one sense because God created us, and so all mankind is accountable to God. But in a, a greater sense, and in this passage in specifically, in this passage specifically, Paul is speaking of our accountability to the Lord because we belong to him as his children, as servants, because we've been bought with a price, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6.20. We have been redeemed by the precious blood of Christ. So we belong to him. Jesus gave his life to pay the wrath, to, to satisfy the wrath of God on our behalf. And then he rose from the grave. And because of that, we are his servants. We are children of God through faith in Jesus. And so let me just pause there before we go on with the sermon. If you're with us today and you've never turned from your sin and placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, repent and believe as the gospel says, then I urge you to look to Christ for salvation today. Don't, don't see this as just an interesting discussion. I could see this, but for you, you say, this is the dullest sermon I've heard in a long time. That's fine. It, it, but I could see someone who's not a Christian thinking, this is fascinating how Christians learn to deal with one another and they ought to be doing this or whatever. Don't just see this as an intellectual exercise. Come to faith in Jesus Christ. That's what the call is, not to just see this as intellectual exercise. Find hope through faith in Jesus. So each believer is accountable to the Lord, and it's not good for us to violate our consciences because that's not acting by faith, and therefore that is sin. Martin Luther recognized this in one of the most well-known quotes attributed to him. At the Diet of Worms in 1521, he said this. Looks like Diet of Worms. Who wants to have a Diet of Worms, right? It's not, it sounds better if you kind of try to pronounce it German. He said this. Unless I am convinced by sacred scripture or by evident reason, I cannot recant. 
For my conscience is held captive by the word of God, and to act against conscience is neither right nor safe. And that's exactly what Romans 14 is saying. Don't act against your conscience. And our, hopefully our consciences are being held captive by the word of God. Let's look at the third lesson here. We should not judge or harm other believers with respect to issues of conscience. We're almost getting to the part where I start stepping on toes. So if you're waiting for that, it's coming. Don't worry about it. In one sense, we are accountable to one another within the church. Okay? In one sense, we are. When it comes to major sin issues or false teaching, we are accountable to one another, which is why there is such a thing as church discipline. But even in that, the reason that we're acting is out of our ultimate accountability to the Lord. But as I said a moment ago, the issue here that we're talking about in Romans 14, the emphasis when it comes to conscience issues, is our accountability to the Lord. You are accountable to Him, and so am I. We're all accountable to the Lord. And when it comes to those types of issues, we are not accountable to one another. That's why Paul says in verse 4, Who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. There was a real danger that Paul is attacking in this text. And that danger is that the believers were judging one another. They were refusing to accept one another out of disagreement on issues of conscience. They say, how can you eat that, man? That's not right. You shouldn't be. No, don't you know you shouldn't be eating that? And the other guy's sitting there saying, well, dude, I love my bacon. What are you talking about? Right? It's good stuff. Yes, I love my bacon. Well, get off my back. I'm just eating some bacon. It may sound humorous to us. But how many issues are there like that now? To his own master, he stands or falls. And so the problem was attitude. That's the problem that's being addressed here in Romans 14 is attitude. Both sides felt they were right. And because of that, both sides were in danger of having contempt for one another and judging one another on these issues. And that is exactly the kind of thing that goes on today many times in church life and among believers in general. I've seen this many, 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 many times in my 22 years in Christ. And the point that Paul is making that I want to stress as we kind of get into a circular pattern and get towards the end of the message is that it matters how we look at one another. It does. It matters how we look at one another. That absolutely matters. If we are constantly looking down at other people over debatable issues, then the issue is one in our own hearts. It matters. Paul says, don't judge one another. Accept one another as the Lord accepts. Again, not talking about serious sin and being okay with that, just winking at it. That's not okay. Not talking about false teaching here. If we look down at others over debatable issues, over issues of conscience, then there is a problem in our own hearts. Probably the biggest issue that I've seen in recent days involves the way I've seen people interact over these things, over masks. And I'll speak on that more shortly. And let me lay the groundwork once again by repeating this statement that I'm going to say. You say, you repeat yourself a lot. Well, today, that's by intention. It matters how we look at one another. It matters how we look at one another. We're not, Paul says in verse 13, and this is really the heart of the text. If you want to say, what's this passage about? Verse 13 is like the heart of it, like the heart of the cinnamon roll, right? The, the best part. It's that part that you're, you're, you want to get, man. You do the outer part, yeah, it's not that great. That, all scripture is God breathed and profitable for reproof and instruction. Yes, yes. But this is the heart of the message, verse 13. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather determine this, not to put an obstacle or a stumbling block in a brother's way. And so it matters how we look. God is our judge. Not, not you, not me. God is the ultimate judge. And it not only matters how we look at one another, it matters how we treat each other. You think that matters to the Lord, how we treat one another? Let, let, me, let me go back to like Christianity 101, okay? We're not talking about doctoral level stuff here. We're talking about Christianity 101. It was quoted today even in the service. Love your neighbor 
Somebody say, I, I know someone knows it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Right? This is the kind of stuff we teach little kids. Love your, why'd you hit your brother? You want somebody to hit you? No, don't do that. Love your neighbor as yourself. It matters how we treat one another. And that is a struggle for us. It really is. Hence how many times it's repeated in the scriptures, right? Why they have to keep repeating that? Because we don't get it. We don't get it. And we don't love each other. So when it comes to issues of conscience, we must be diligent not to cause harm to one another. There's real danger, especially when we flaunt our Christian liberties before people who don't feel it's appropriate to do certain things. That's exactly what we see in verses 13 through 15. I already read verse 13. He says, I know and am convinced in the Lord Jesus that nothing is in unclean in itself. He just gave his opinion on the matter. But to him who thinks anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. For if because of food your brother is hurt, you are no longer walking according to love. Do not destroy with your food him for whom Christ died. Verses 20 and 21, same thing. Do not tear down the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are clean, but they are evil for the man who eats and gives offense. It is good not to eat meat or to drink wine or to do anything by which your brother stumbles. 1 Corinthians 8, same type of message. Again, there are some differences in that particular text. We don't have time to go into today. But this is what Paul says there. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone sees you who have knowledge dining in an idol's temple, will not his conscience, if he is weak, be strengthened to eat things sacrificed to idols? For through your knowledge, he who is weak is ruined, the brother for whose sake Christ died. And so by sinning against the brethren and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food causes my brother to stumble, I will never eat meat again. Dude, that's pretty serious for most of us. I'm pretty sure you think about that. You're going vegetarian because I know that's, that's, a, that's a serious matter. This is not a small thing. That's a big thing. I don't want to go vegetarian because I really like meat. Paul says... If, if I know, if food causes my brother to stumble, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause my brother to stumble. That's the heart that we're called to, to be unselfish, not to be, it's my right to eat that meat. And Paul says, if I know that that's going to cause a brother to stumble, I love that brother so much that I'm willing to never eat meat again. I don't know how long the Lord's going to give me. I could be dead tomorrow. But normal lifespan, maybe 30, 40 more years. Can I imagine going the next 40 years without eating any type of meat? That's not good. And yet Paul said, I personally, maybe you don't even care, but pick whatever you, you'll never eat chocolate again or whatever. Never eat meat again. Why? Because love your brother. Love your sister. That is what we are called to, to love one another. And that leads us to the last lesson in our text. Lesson four, we are called to pursue unity, love, peace, and edification rather than the reckless pursuit of our Christian liberties. Verse 15, Paul says that the problem is that when we're, we're doing these things. We're flaunting our supposed free, freedoms in Christ. We're no longer walking in love. We're selfish. Paul says, stop. Stop being selfish. We're more concerned about our rights than our brothers and sisters in Christ. And he's saying something is wrong in here. And so rather than harming others, what we should be doing is pursuing the things that you see there in front of you. Unity, love, peace, and edification. Hence Paul's words in verse 19. So then we pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. Those are the things we don't, we we pursue them, we go after them. We want to be unified and love one another and not just disagree on everything and fight over it. We don't enforce, we don't try to enforce uniformity on issues that we may honestly disagree with. 
And so I stepped in it. Let me go ahead and step in it again. Sure, I brought up this issue of masks. Now, I know that Christians don't agree on this issue. I know that people at Rikers Ridge Baptist Church do not agree with this issue. So what do you think about them, Pastor Kevin? What do you think? It doesn't really matter what I think. I think if I look at the text here, it doesn't really matter what I think. Because what I know is that we are called to pursue unity, love, peace, and edification. That's what we're called to pursue. And so if by wearing a mask I won't cause a brother or sister to stumble, then I'll wear a mask regardless of what I personally think about the issue. Can we mature to the point where we say, I love a brother or sister more than my rights? But all I hear from the culture is, my rights, my rights. And God says, what about your rights? How about love for one another? That's what we're called to pursue. To love you even if we differ and even maybe to accommodate you in that. Because, why? Because I love you. Because we love each other. And so Paul says he he would be willing to give up meat forever. That seems a lot harder than wearing a mask. I have the thing surgically attached if it's got a hole so I can put my meat in it. I'm not trying to make you angry if you're an anti-masker, okay? Because I have to love you too. I'm not here to judge people who disagree with me on the topic, and neither are you here to judge people who disagree with you on that topic. Say, but I hate masks, Pastor Kevin. Who actually likes those things anyway? Nobody likes those. That's not the issue. The issue is not masks. The kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, and it's not masks either. The issue is our attitudes towards one another and the way that we treat each other. We are called to love one another. Even if we disagree on things, even if they're really important to us, we are called to love each other. That's my primary concern, and based on this text, that's the Lord's primary concern too. God cares how we treat each other and how we look at each other. God cares about those things. And this discussion could extend to lots of other hot topics that are threatening to divide us at the moment. So let me just tick off a few of those. What to shut down or not to shut it down on account of the pandemic. Politics and elections, a specific of police reform and how to pursue racial reconciliation. Now, let me clarify there. Racism is wrong. There's no debate there. I'm talking about specific policy decisions, economic issues, climate change, foreign policy, how to fix the health care system, and on and on and on and on. We've seen it in churches way before all the current hubbub about everything. Uh, in one church, it's, it's, it's holidays. And so somebody comes and says, worst thing ever, a pagan to have a Christmas tree or whatever. I'm like, well, you can think that. Don't put a Christmas tree up in your house. Well, let's be kind to each other and gracious, even though we might disagree on those things. Or it's vaccines or it's breastfeeding or it's so on. And we've seen it all, haven't we? There's all sorts of things we've seen like that. On and on and on. It really troubles me how often today I hear people making statements like you can't be a real Christian and think such and such or vote or not vote this way or do or do not do this particular thing really are we pursue are we elevating issues to core orthodoxy that are not there what is he saying here accept one another we're not talking about major sin issues or false teaching here we're saying and you can feel passionately about those things Maybe you're going to throw a rock through my window. One of my best friends was on the news. His church, they broke the windows in his church. (laughs) Don't do that. Don't break my house windows either if you don't like this sermon. Are we elevating debatable issues to the status of core orthodoxy? When people say things like that, I just want to say, have you ever even read Romans 14? Do you know that that's in your Bible? Have you ever even read that? Are we, is that attitude and pronouncement pleasing to the Lord God? Is it pleasing to the Lord? Have you put yourself in the place of God? Can we not love and accept one another in spite of our disagreements? My friends, this is a call to repentance for for my own attitudes as well. How do we look at each other? Right? How how do we look at each other? Do we look at each other? Well, we 
spiritual. You would think like this, do this. Ugh. Is that attitude pleasing to Jesus? My friends, it matters how we look at each other. And it matters how we treat one another. So this is a call to repentance. It matters how we see each other. Here's another one I've heard a lot. I don't see how anyone could think such and such. Okay, so maybe we practice what we learned in last, last week's passage. How about we shut our mouths for a moment, we open our ears, and we set aside our bad temper for a moment and actually listen to people and try to hear what they're saying. That, that, I think that would actually make a world of difference. And maybe in the end we don't, dis, we don't agree on whatever the issue is, and that's fine. But we can say, you know what? If you're in Christ, you're my brother, you're my sister, and I love you. You know, for the sake of argument, let's even say that someone's wrong about whatever the issue may be. You ever been wrong about something as a Christian? Oh, Lord. Oh, we plead the mercies of Christ. If I look back at my early Christian life and I look at some things that I thought and did or whatever, I would be horrified. What are you doing, you idiot? I look back at last week, I would probably say that. What are you doing, you idiot? Can we not extend that same mercy to other people? Isn't this what God's called us to do? Love one another. We've come to the end of our series, and I'm sure you're happy for that. Can we, how can we honor Jesus in troubled times? Let me review once more what we've learned, and we'll close. If we're going to honor Jesus in troubled times, we will keep the gospel primary. The gospel has to be primary. Lose the gospel, you lose everything. We'll not fear, but we'll trust, obey, and pray. We will live godly lives in the midst of an ungodly world. We will be more eager to listen than to speak or get angry. And we will walk in love and pursue unity within the family of God. Those are the things that we will do if we are to honor Jesus in troubled times. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the love that you have for us in spite of ourselves. God, if we're honest, we see the depth of our own sin, the ugliness of it. Maybe that's what we need to do more. Then it will make it so much easier for us to be tender-hearted, forgiving one another as you in Christ have forgiven us. May that be our heartbeats, Lord, when we disagree on issues that may even be very important to us. To be charitable. To love people who are different than us. To accept one another as you have accepted us through Christ. God, help us to love others the way that you love us. For your glory alone, we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.